Hello and welcome to News Now. I am Adebola Adeduba. The headlines. Court remands former CBN Governor Emefiele in EFCC custody pending Bain application hearing. Binance executive remanded in Kuje Correctional Center over money laundry allegation. Mozambique ferry accident kills at least 96. Details shortly. Let's begin by telling you that a Lagos State Special Offenses Court has ordered the remand of former Central Bank of Nigeria Governor Godwin Emefiele to the custody of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission on charges of abuse of office. Justice Raman Ushudi issued the remand order following Emefiele's arraignment alongside his co-defendant Henry Omole on a 26-count charge related to abuse of office. During the proceedings, Emefiele's lawyer, Abdul Karim Ladi Lawan sought bail for his client on self recognition or the most lenient terms possible. He urged the court to consider granting bail based on similar terms previously approved by another court. While Emefile awaits the judge's decision on his bail application, Omole has been remanded in the custody of the Nigerian Correctional Services. This development comes amid another ongoing prosecution against Emefile at the Federal Capital Territory High Court in Abuja for alleged fraudulent financial transactions during his tenure. A former Vice President Atuka Abubakar has voiced serious concerns regarding the recently approved 700 km Lagos Calabar Coastal Highway project, alleging irregularities in the decision to award the contract to Gilbert Chaguru High Tech Construction Company Limited. A Tiku statement released on Sunday by his media advisor Paul Ebe shines a spotlight on what he perceives as the Bola Tinubu administration's inclination towards questionable deals. A ticker recalled that the project had previously been initiated during the Good Luck Jonathan's administration in November 2014, with the contract awarded to the China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation for $11.97 billion. However, the project was not executed before the administration's tenure ended. Subsequently, President Mohamed Bouhari's administration reduced the cost to $11.1 billion and extended the completion period to three years, but progress on the project remained stagnant. The former vice president recalled that in September 2023, barely weeks after being appointed by Tinubu Works Minister, engineer Dave Umai refused to reveal how much the project would cost, saying the project would come to a zero cost to Nigeria. However, Atiku noted that to the shock of many Nigerians, Umayi returned to FEC with a memo in March 2024, seeking the approval of 1.06 trillion naira that would be paid to Chaguri's firm for the first phase of a project which is wholly in Lagos. Expressing dismay, Atiku highlighted the lack of transparency in awarding the contract to a high-tech construction company limited, emphasizing the absence of competitive bidding or approval by the Federal Executive Council. Let's talk politics now. The Deputy Governor of Edo State, Philip Shwaibu, has been impeached by the State Assembly. This comes after the adoption of the report of a seven-man panel that investigated allegations of misconduct against him. The panel ended at sitting on Friday with Shwaibu or his counsel failing to show up to defend the allegations leveled against him. The panel had adjourned till Thursday for Shwaibu to open his defense and when he didn't show up, he was given till Friday to come and defend the allegation against him, which he failed to do so. The Edo State House Assembly, which is the petitioner in the case, had on Wednesday opened and closed its case, paving the way for Shwaibu to defend the allegations leveled against him. And to talk about this in detail, I'm joined live on the news by a public affairs analyst, Dr. Ambrose Igoke. Good afternoon. Glad to have you join me. Good afternoon. Yes, let me start by your thoughts on the impeachment of Philip uh, Shwaibo. 
we have all uh, seen it coming. Um, the Mr. Philip Schreiber, I, in my own thinking, should have resigned a long time ago. Uh, he didn't get. He didn't need to wait for us to have this a uh, long fight between him and his um, and his uh, boss, who is the governor of Baseki. Uh, for almost two years, there have been a shadow war. Um, you know, and since he knows that his principal, which is the governor, did not want him to contest the governorship election, he would have uh, honorably resigned and to seek his political pursuits uh, somewhere else, maybe in another political party. But he, he, he stood there, he stayed behind, and we're having all kinds of uh, acre money. The time that was supposed to govern at those states, they were using it to fight all sort of a criminal's war. And this is what political, and I wonder what he was doing, because he was supposed to have just resigned and left. And on the other hand, um, most of the time, only a few governors in the past in uh, Nigeria allowed their deputy to take over from them. Only a few states, maybe like, uh, I think, Abia, during the time of Rodgers or Carlo. Uh, uh, no, even to allow Abaribe to take over. So it's not a, a Kano is a very good example where I think they have groomed themselves. Kano have a very good succession uh, plan over the years where the deputies took over from them. Um, but apart from Kano and maybe one or two other places, uh, it is not up to, I think, I don't think it's up to 1% of the states mm. uh, that allow their deputy to take over from the I don't know why, why this happens, but. It has become a tradition that governors don't want their deputies to take over from them. And when Saibu saw that and he had interest in contesting, what he would have done was just to resign, go to another political party, and pursue your, your ambition uh, instead of staying there and having a rough fight with the government. Well, uh, the I, government I guess then, himself, yeah, just to uh, quickly chip in there. Dr. Iboke, just to quickly chip in there, are you then agreeing to speculations that the governor, uh, Godwin Obaseki, could have instigated these impeachments? What is good we have instigated it. I mean, we all know how these things work. These are backdoor political things. Um basically did not make it, did not pretend about the fact that he didn't want the deputy governor to contest the election. He didn't also hide the fact that he was not in good terms with the deputy governor. There were times he, the deputy governor was locked out. There were times he was uh, you know, there were there were times there were the pages of newspapers, they were fighting each other. There were the time they were making incendiary statements against each other. There was a time the party hierarchy from Abuja had to come to mediate. So they have been fighting. Uh, therefore, uh, we all know how those things work. Uh, the governor has the power most of the time to control the House of Assembly. But, but, but then and he later then, came out. Know, yes. Uh, tribal, there was no Just way to highlight to that. But then he later came out and gave his approval and, for uh, him to run for office. Dr. Again, Iboke, are you there? Come again. Yes, I was just following your line of thought regarding uh, Philip Shwaibu, as well as the governor of, uh, you know, Edo State, uh, that's uh, Godwin uh, Obaseki. He later came out and gave approval for Philip Shwaibu to run for office. I don't, I don't, I, I don't believe in that. That's just window dress. He never wanted him to run the, uh, for office. And those are just... Uh, I mean, the public statements to make it look as if it is uh, working. They have been had, uh, the acrimony has continued. And uh, if the acrimony did not continue, why did the governor not, not wage it when the house was in a hurry to induct Shwaibu? We started sitting on Wednesday, they gave uh, this thing on Thursday, and they told you, the counsel to Shwaibu said, told them that the case was in court. So it would be like prejudice to try to see something that was already in court. The impeachment issues were in court. And then by Monday, we are rushing to give, uh, we have submitted by Friday, and by Monday, we are rushing to impeach him. And we say that he want us to, we are not details, but this rule should not take us for granted. So if they were not in the hurry, why did they not, why did they rush the process? They would have waited, I think today was the court uh, sitting in Abuja. Uh, so why did they rush to announce it before the court sitting? Uh, so these are the kind of uh, political petty plays we play that uh, stunts development. It's not of course to concentrate on uh, uh, development for the people while we are elected. We are here playing uh, PIGO uh, activities here. Uh, so it doesn't benefit the people of Edo State and uh, it doesn't uh, add any value to democracy. 
Let's take a look at the accusation from the Edo State House of Assembly, which is that Philip Shwaibu breached a secrecy oath as well as allegations of office misconduct. What's your reaction or your thought on that? I don't know if the Edo State House of Assembly is still operating uh, with the colonial rules or still operating in the 70s and 80s and even 90s. Still talking about a um, uh, secret of official oath in the era of Freedom of Information Act, uh, Freedom of Information Law, FOI. So, um, what is secret information? What in the uh, Federal Council Council is not a security body. The Federal Council Executive Council, I mean, the State Executive Council, the State Executive Council sit for the welfare uh, of citizens, especially their economic welfare. welfare uh, for another socioeconomic welfare in their issues. Uh, uh, so they are not a security meeting where you say you are, uh, you know, we are endangering security operations. So all this in the of the security tools and all those things do not apply in a democracy. I mean, the Freedom of Financial Act is there. So if the uh, deputy governor has documents to tender to court or to, uh, you know, validate some of his claims or some things happening, why not? What is a secret oath? Is it a secret court? The government of Edo State is not a secret court. The government of Edo State uh, is not uh, uh, where you go take oath that uh, you took an oath on the door of uh, Swarini to uphold the constitution, to uphold for the welfare of the work for the welfare of the citizens of Edo State. So I don't know what they mean by uh, a secret oath. That's for me is a matter. Well, you've rightly cleared what your thoughts are regarding the secrecy oath which they alleged he broke. How about the allegation of misconduct of office? You know, the, you know, when you throw all this kind of allegation, there are two. There are, it's wide ranging. You need to break it down. What is misconduct of office? You need to analyze specifically what he has done. But here we have a House of Assembly made up of. Uh, uh, learned people who just bandy words up and down, generalize everything. So you need to be specific. What did he commit? What are the authorities? There says anti-party activity. Anti-party, well, the Edo state government is not uh, the party. The Edo state government is a government. So we uh, let the party handle that and see what to do with that. You don't bring it into governance. So we have not even heard about the gross misconduct. These are languages that, you know, don't define anything. We don't throw it in the air like that. And then we're wrong with it. Uh, so for me, it's not convincing enough. When you say somebody has gross misconduct, name the cruise. That means the misconduct is not your just misconduct. That means it is heavy. Name them. You are not even named serious ones. Uh, you don't even name, we don't have like five to ten reasons why it is of gross misconduct. Yet you say it is gross misconduct. So we need to uh, there those things have to supply us the details of this gross misconduct. I will have to know whether this gross misconduct is the impeachable offense. If they are not impeachable offences, then a person can have gross misconduct that are not impeachable. Mm. Not all misconducts are impeachable. So if there are conducts that needs to for him to be suspended, for him to be done, then we can know what is about. Even if he says gross misconduct, we need to list it so that we know, we have to interrogate it to know whether they are impeachable offences. Uh, so finally, these are the things that is hide and seek game that playing with us and giving us half truths, giving us a big statements here and there. Mm. that we cannot actually authenticate or scrutinize. Nice. In closing, just one final question for you. This recent impeachment, how do you think it impacts the politics in Edo State? Well, it, 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 there's uh, a lot of politics going on now because, you know, Edo State is uh, going to contest an election. So the party's uh, candidates have uh, emerged. Um, there's a, a lot going on. The, there's a lot of bad blood between the governor and his deputy. So it's a contest of personal interest. It does not concern the Edo people. What they are fighting for are personal interests. Obaseki is fighting for his own personal interests. Uh, Shwaibu is fighting for his own personal interests and how to consolidate power in the Edo state. It has nothing to do with the welfare of uh, the uh, Edo citizens, or it has nothing to do with construction of road, provision of uh, health facilities, improving education, and other uh, infrastructure or growth. Uh, these are just personal that data. Going back, the money being spent uh, in uh, legal cases, uh, the amount hours being wasted, the time to be used to discuss progress is being used to which comes and fight each other. And so these are petty politics that are not supposed to. So, so it has, in a way, 
puts uh, uh, Mr. Schwabe in a disadvantaged position uh, because it is no longer, and knowing that politics in Nigeria is about what we call follow, follow politics, where you actually, as much as you dispense papers, that is when you have followership. Most of the followers are not grounded in ideology and all those things, they're just grounded in stomach infrastructure. So, uh, you know, it's a disadvantage to you. And the Constitution of Federal Republic of Nigeria has made the deputy governor very, very vulnerable. He has made him like a spare tire to a car. Uh, the governor is fully in charge. And so the might of a governor is when you want to do a comparative analysis between him and his deputy, the deputy is, is you know, something to be crushed immediately with the might of the governor. And so they are not in the same pedestal when it talks about I'm of afraid might. that's the most that's very take serious on the news. To, uh, Mr. Shrive. That's the most we can take on the news. Thank you so much for your insight. Dr. Ambrose Igoke, Public Affairs Analyst, thank you once again. You're watching News Central now. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. Thank you for staying tuned. The Kano State Governor, Abba Yusuf, has urged the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission to release the result of its probe into the alleged dollar bribery video involving immediate past Governor Abdullah Ganduje. Yusuf, in the statement on Sunday by his spokesperson, Sanusi Tofa, said Ganduje should rather be ashamed of himself and prepare to face his trial instead of talking about non-existent failure in the current administration. The administration of Governor Yusuf emphasized that it would leave no stone unturned to pursue the dollar video scandal to a logical conclusion. He, however, requested the release of the forensic investigation conducted by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission on what has been referred to as Gando Dollar Saga in 2018 for public consumption. In the meantime, a federal high court in Abuja has remanded a Binance executive, Tigran Gambayan, in Kuje Correctional Center, pending the determination of his bill application. The trial judge, Justice Emeka Nwite, gave the order after Gambayan pleaded not guilty to the money laundering charges preferred against him by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission on Monday. The judge subsequently adjourned the matter till April 18th for the ruling on his bill application and 2nd of May for commencement of trial. The federal government of Nigeria has announced ambitious plans to revolutionize the national identity system by introducing three new identity cards for approximately 104 million citizens across the nation. According to reports from the National Identity Management Commission, these innovative cards include a bank-enabled national ID card, a social intervention card, and optional ECOWAS national biometric identity card. Speaking in an, in an interview, Ayod Deli Babalola, the technical advisor for media and communication to the Director General of NIMC, revealed that Nigerians can expect to receive these groundbreaking identity cards within the next one or two months following their launch in May. However, the specific launch date is contingent upon approval from the presidency. He added that the activation of the National Safety Net card will address urgent authentication needs and provide a secure platform for government services such as palliatives, primarily targeting the 25 million vulnerable Nigerians supported by current government intervention programs. The River State Police Command has issued a strong caution to all parties involved in the political turmoil gripping the state, urging them to refrain from actions that could jeopardize peace and stability. In a statement released on Sunday, the command emphasized its commitment to maintaining law and order, saying it will not tolerate any attempts to disrupt the peace that, that residents of the state deserve. It adds that the command is aware of inflammatory remarks circulating among political circles and urges all parties to exercise restraint and adhere to the rule of law. The River State Police Command has set its role as the enforcer of law and protector of lives and property, bound to take decisive action against any violators as tensions continue to simmer in the state. 
Nigeria's National Association of Scrap Waste Dealers Association has called for the relaxation of the indefinite ban imposed by the Bronu State Government to allow hundreds of its members to pick up their means of survival. The group made a call shortly after distributing food items to its members and their families in Maiduguri, the Bronu State capital. Our correspondent Umaru Kirawa has details. Metal waste scavenging used to be a brisk business, providing food to millions of people and opportunities to team in youth in Nigeria's northeast state of Porno. In a bid to cope the rampant theft of metal materials, the Borno state government imposed a ban on metal scavenging on July 10, 2023. However, Nigeria's National Association of Scrap Waste Dealers and Sellers representing the interest of those involved in the scrap waste industry has raised concerns over the impact of the ban on their livelihood. We know our governor is a benevolent governor and he has already observed so many things before he did this. So we beg his pardon to, 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 to rebuild the embargo so that uh, uh, the people will have some reliefs. We launched this palliative to our members to alleviate the association believes that alternative solutions such as the use of task force and strengthened collaboration with security agencies should be explored to address the issue of theft as it is done in other states. We therefore call on the governor to please revisit his decision to fish out the criminals that caused the bans and allow the other good citizens to continue with their business. Allowing them to continue with this business will increase the income of the revenue of the state. They noted the importance of collaboration and dialogue in addressing the challenges posed by metal theft while safeguarding the interest of the scrap waste industry. At least our population of Ajakuta, including the scavengers, is more than 300,000 people. The recycling business is the reason that China and Indian economy is booming because they give jobs to our team in unemployed youth. It remains to be seen how the Borno state government will respond to these concerns while balancing the need for public safety and addressing the economic impact on vulnerable communities. In Maiduguri for News Central, Umuri Kirawa. The spread of misinformation and irresponsible commentary on social media platforms is once again coming to the spotlight following a recent case involving popular gospel singer Messi Chingwo. Allegations linking the singer's newborn to Pastor Nathaniel Bassi, made by anonymous social media users, have raised questions about the ethics and repercussions of digital discourse. Our correspondent, Ni Yomoni, has more. The story began with a simple rumor that spiraled out of control on platforms like X and Facebook, demonstrating the alarming power of social media to influence public opinion and harm reputations. This incident underscores a growing trend of social media misuse where individuals often hide behind the anonymity of their screens, publish and comment without considering the consequences. In the case of Messi Chimbo, the narrative spread rapidly, leading to significant distress for all parties involved. The incident is resonant of another social media fastum surrounding the social media user Very Darkman, an influencer arrested for his comments online. These instances highlight a broader issue, the ease with which social media can be used as a weapon to perpetrate slander, harassment and emotional distress. We went to the authorities to submit a petition on behalf of our client, Pastor Nathaniel Bassi. Our police officers, they know the law. They know what the criminal code talks about and defam criminal defamation in section 373 and 375. They know what, what the criminal cyber crimes act of 2015 talks about. So you will look at this act, you will see that these guys, these persons have gone beyond the law. Diverse reasons fuel such behavior from seeking attention or amusement to harboring malicious intent. While enforcement remains a challenge, 
and legal system is often playing catch up with the rapidly evolving digital landscape. The law on cyber crimes and online harassment is clear. You now damage somebody's reputation. That means you posted information on news that is not confirmed or you are sure that it is true before you posted it. Five years imprisonment or minimum of 15 million naira fine. Damage to reputation. One year imprisonment. Before you post, confirm or has two portion of rice. I don't read the social media anymore. <laughs> They abuse hell out of me. In the past, the Nigerian government took steps to regulate social media content, proposing bills like the Social Media Bill of 2019, which sparked controversy and debates about censorship and freedom of speech. The delicate balance between protecting citizens from online abuse and safeguarding their rights to digital expression remains a contentious issue. So you have freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, um, freedom of association, and the rest. And now, these are all these freedoms. All these freedoms actually make up what is called civic space. Now, if anything affects these freedoms, it automatically means that you're limiting it. I buy the idea of being regulated because of the kind of thing they are posting. You know, it really corrupts our youth. Even I, as a, as a person, I do scared of handing over my phone to my son. As Nigeria grapples with the repercussions of the Mesa Chinwo incident and others like it, the need for a societal shift in social media usage becomes ever more apparent. It is a collective responsibility, one that involves users, platforms and policymakers to ensure that the digital space remains a forum for positive engagement rather than a breeding ground for harm and misinformation. In Lagos for New Central, Ni Omani. The Nigerian Meteorological Agency has predicted sunshine and thunderstorms from Monday to Wednesday. Nimet's weather outlook release on Sunday in Abuja forecasts sunny and hazy atmosphere over parts of Yobe and Baranu State on Monday, with chances of thunderstorms over parts of Kebi State. According to Nimet, the remaining parts of North should be sunny with patches of cloud during the morning periods. Sunny skies with few clouds, patches are expected over the north central region with prospect of isolated thunderstorms over parts of Niger, Kwara, Benue during the morning hours. Coming up, over 90 persons perish in Mozambique boat tragedy. We have details after the break. Join us again. Thank you for staying with us. In the east of the continent, Rwanda has begun a week of national mourning and 100 days of commemoration to mark the 30th anniversary of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Rwandan President Paul Kagame noted his country has made tremendous progress since the genocide as a result of the choices they made together to resurrect the nation by embracing national unity. The flame of remembrance was lit on April 7th and will be left on for seven days at four genocide memorial sites in different parts of the country. Our correspondent, Bongani Siziba, has more. The day started with the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, the first lady and the guest laying wreath at the Kigali Memorial Center. They also proceeded to light the flame of remembrance. It's a flame of hope that keeps light for 100 days, the time that lasted the genocide tragedy. The commemoration proceeded to the BK Arena, where people from all walks of life came together to commemorate the 1994 Rwanda genocide. Amongst the crowd, survivors, dignitaries and supporters standing united to remember their lives lost and honor their memories. We commemorate because those lives mattered to us. Rwandans cannot afford to be indifferent to root causes of genocide. We will always pay maximum attention even if we are 
a lot. But what we are seeking is solidarity and partnership to recognize and confront these threats together as a global community. Do you quench by exterminating others? What will be what will be able to say or do today? First, to accomplish our duty to remember there has to be remembrance. You have to remember so you don't forget. You have to also remember to understand the depth of these wounds inflicted on this nation. President Kagame also expressed his gratitude to all those who came in support of this journey. A moment of reflection. Between, uh, uh, between 10 and 15th uh, April, th more than 350 people in my neighborhood were killed, including my family. So I started feeling that maybe I don't have a right to live. In a historic moment, France acknowledges its role in the genocide and expresses remorse for its misdeeds. This admission paves the way for the healing and reconciliation between the two nations. For those who lost their loved ones, the day serves as a reminder of the past. I'm so proud for President Kagame and what he's really doing in this country and what he said also for us. We need to believe on what we do and know that nobody we suppose first to count of us and to work today hard as African and change the game, like I always said. The things that happened uh, over 30 years ago should never happen. And uh, we believe that uh, it's something that we have to express solidarity with the Rwandese people. It's a lesson also to all other African countries that these things should never happen. For many Rwandans here, the spirit of resilience, unity and forgiveness shines brighter as they continue with their journey of healing. At the BK Arena in Kigali, for News Central, Wongani, Siziba. From the sinking of a makeshift ferry boat off the north coast of Mozambique has risen to 96. A local authority reports that a severely overcrowded makeshift ferry carrying around roughly 130 passengers capsized off the northern coast near Nampulu province. Nampula Secretary of State James Neto confirmed the tragedy, citing the vessel's unsuitability for passenger transport and overcrowding as the cause of the sinking. He added that the rescue efforts are on the way, hampered by rough sea conditions. So far, five survivors have been pulled from the wreckage, but the search continues amidst challenging weather. Neto revealed that the passengers were attempting to reach an island off the coast, likely driven by panic due to misinformation about cholera outbreaks on the mainland. You're live with New Central TV. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. Thank you for staying tuned. A recent report by the Corporate Accountability and Public Participation Africa has sparked debate on how to tackle obesity and diabetes in Nigeria. The report, titled Potential Fiscal and Public Health Effects of Sugar, Sweet and Beverage Tax in Nigeria, proposes a significant increase in SSB taxes from the current 10 Naira per litre to 130 Naira per litre. And to unpack these, I'm joined live in the studio by Dr. Ogo Okiti, CEO Think Business Africa. Good afternoon, glad to have you join me. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me this afternoon. Let me start with your impression of the proposed increase in tax from 10 to 130 Naira for sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, I, I think I said in the previous report, uh, the report by CAPA was actually very, very pivotal. It's a very, very important report. 
uh, in the journey of understanding the growth in diabetes and uh, growth in obesity in Nigeria. However, the challenge with the report was that he saw increases in SSP tax as the silver bullet uh, to, to, to reducing that growth, and that is not the case. Uh, SSB and, of course, obesity and, uh, 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 and diabetes are much, much complex. And uh, there is no direct causation. There's a correlation. And, of course, there's contribution by SSB. But there is no direct causation uh, between SSB and, of course, uh, the growth in diabetes and the growth in obesity. So if we go by the analysis that they did in their report, uh, increasing that uh, SSB uh, current term, 10 naira per liter to 139 would not solve the problem. So we are trying to look for how to solve the problem here. But what they have come up with, we actually not solve the problem. And the reason are three. One, the data that they use are actually weak. Uh, the data is very weak. And of course, there are discrepancies in the data. One of the discrepancies is that the, uh, the BMI, that's the body max index data that they actually use, suggests that women are more obese than men. However, in the consumption of SSB, men, are actually, men do actually consume more SSB than women. So th that does not match at all. The second point is that the report, the BMI data that they also used, uh, is an aggregation of different surveys uh, from 1990 to 2017. Uh, so uh, that looks like, oh, so much data. However, if they had monitored, let's say, 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 people over the same period in terms of their consumption of SSB and the growth in their BMI, we'll be able to trace uh, uh, the, the dynamics. But that report did not do that. It just took static surveys uh, from different places, and that was a problem. In terms of Yes, go ahead. Mm. I'll come back to the details of this report yeah. and then the loopholes, which you have rightly pointed out. But then do you think these proposed tasks could likely stifle industry growth? Absolutely. And I think uh, that's the point. Uh, if you are going to increase taxes, uh, the taxes must have an objective. And the objective of the taxes that they have, inc I mean, the increase, the objective of, of what their own objective is to control diabetes and to control the growth of obesity. However, these taxes, where anytime it is increased, will not solve that problem. It will rather stifle investment, uh, jobs, and growth of the industry. So that's actually the problem. The fiscal solution will not solve the health problem that it is meant to solve. And that is exactly the point that Think Business Africa has made in its own report. Okay, just to reiterate what you mentioned earlier on, you talked about no direct correlation between SSB and, of course, obesity or diabetes, as, it, you know, as the case may be. But then beyond all of this taxation, what other measures do you think can be employed to address health concerns related to sugary drinks in Nigeria? That is a very excellent question. So let me go back to the data that you use. Uh, the BMI data that they actually used, the conclusion in that report, that's Adi of 2021, the conclusion of that report said that the causes of BMI, that's the cause of growth in BMI, is sedentary lifestyle, lifestyle uh, consumption of processed foods, and um, urbanization, and of course, increase in income. Uh, so there are so many factors that actually lead to the growth in obesity and the growth in diabetes. So it is not just the mere consumption of SSB, which obviously there's also a correlation and it actually contributes. But what we are saying, it is much, much complex than that. I may be obese, uh, but not necessarily because I consume SSB. So if you actually increase the taxes on SSB, it may not eventually solve my problem. And it is that linkage, I believe, that we need more data. We need more understanding. We need more analysis before we come to the conclusion of whether it is important for the taxes to be increased or not. Hmm. You rightly pointed out the loophole in this report, you know, saying that there is no direct correlation when it comes to SSB and obesity or diabetes, as the case may be. What would be your recommendation in carrying out a report which is close to infallible? Okay, so for me, I think uh, uh, two things. One is that can we monitor obese and diabetic people over time? So uh, we get a good data of monitoring them over time. 
and monitoring their consumption of SSB. Uh, that's number one. Number two, to understand where they are, to understand their environmental conditions, uh, and to understand all other things that contribute to that. That's number two. And number three, we have we have had SSB of 10 Naira per liter since 2022. Um, how has that helped so far? As that there's no data, there's no evidence to suggest that the introduction of that tax has actually reduced the consumption of SSB. Uh, so it is, if it has not reduced, it is not uh, conclusive to say, oh, because it is not adequate. Oh, because the elasticity uh, is not sensitive enough. It is not, we can't just suggest that. We need to also understand what has happened since that introduction and whether the resources have actually been targeted at controlling the growth of diabetes and controlling the growth of obesity in Nigeria. We don't have data, we don't have that evidence, and we are not sure where we are in relation to the resources and to the problem it is that we are trying to solve in Nigeria, in Darga. And I think those are the things that we need to do. So there are two, three, four other things that we need to do before we come to the conclusion of increase in SSB tax. Thank you so much for your expertise and, of course, your kind company, Dr. Ogo Okiti, CEO, Think Business Africa. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for having me. And now to sports stories. Sports Minister Senator John Owen Eno has spurred the Super Falcons ahead of their crucial Olympic qualifying match in Pretoria, urging them to shatter Nigeria's 16-year Olympic absence in female football. With a 1-0 lead from the first leg, he emphasizes belief and resilience, stating the Falcons have shown strength. Now is their time. Eno urges them to play with passion and unity, aiming not just for victory, but to inspire generations. He calls on all Nigerians to support the team of firming together, let's make history as the face Bayana Bayana. Nigeria's hope ride with the Falcons who carry the dreams of millions. Senator Enos Truallin cry echoes the nation's favor for success on the international stage. With that singular commitment, I saw you play on Friday and I believe undoubtedly that you I believe that you'll be merge as you go for this match. So it's to bid you farewell and to let you appreciate the enormity of the responsibility that you carry on your hands. As young as you all are, you are the treasure of history. Dreams FC achieved a historic milestone in Kumasi on Sunday, advancing to the CAF Confederation Cup semi-finals for the first time by defeating Stad Malien. Despite a commanding lead from the first leg, Dreams FC secured their spots in the last four, marking their debut appearance with distinction. With a 2-1 victory in the initial leg in Bamako, they managed a 1-1 draw in the second leg at the Baba Yara Stadium, resisting Stad Malian's efforts to reverse the deficit. Despite a goal initially celebrated by Derek Aguirre, which was later annulled by the video assistant referee, Dreams FC persevered, with Sylvester Simba's equalizer proving crucial. Despite conceding to Euro Diaby, Dreams FC's resilience prevailed, propelling the team to the next stage. They now anticipate facing either Zamalek or future FC, setting the stage for another momentous clash. And that's all on the news. But before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Court remands former CBN governor Emefile in EFCC custody pending bail application hearing. Binance executive remanded in Kuje Correctional Center over money laundry allegation. Mozambique ferry accident kills at least 96. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduba.